So I want to welcome everyone to Hot Lunch, the first of uh, this uh, new year in 2022, and um, also to wish everyone a happy new year. Uh, both we're having Lunar New Year coming up uh, for those uh, who celebrate Lunar New Year, but uh, uh, happy new year to all those who, who have also uh, been three weeks into uh, into the new year according to the, uh, uh, the Gregorian calendar. Um, acknowledge that we are, or I am, um, uh, joining you from the unceded ancestral traditional territories of the Musqueam people that uh, in Vancouver we are on the unceded territories of Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. If there are some who are joining from UBC Okanagan, um, UBC Okanagan is on the unceded territory of the Silks Nation. Um, I My name is Henry Yu. Uh, I'm the principal of uh, St. John's College, the, the host of Hot Lunch, as well as uh, teach in the history department. Um, and so, yeah, I want to uh, thank first and foremost the uh, committee, the Hot Lunch committee that puts this on each month and has for the last eight years, uh, Stacey Barber and uh, Jennifer Liu from St. John's College, who uh, do a lot of the logistics and organizing behind the scene, Eilish Courtney, um, liaison uh, Musqueam UBC special projects, uh, but formerly also uh, from ceremonies office and for, for many years, uh, a staff at UBC who helped put on graduation and uh, ceremonial events that, that really are at the heart of our, our operations. Uh, Shirley Nakata, who's uh, our ombudsperson and uh, as someone who was really one of the uh, first proponents for having a uh, hot lunch as a, as a way of bringing staff together over a hot meal. Andrew Parr, uh, Associate Vice President, Student Housing Community Services, who, who also, I think, uh, has been a longtime UBC staff. So thanks to all of them for the continued work at uh, helping organize uh, hot lunch. Um, I'm going to keep the introduction short because, uh, you know, we all are very proud that uh, since coming here and joining UBC, uh, President Santa Ono has, has been uh, a guest at Hot Lunch uh, every single year uh, he's been here. And so uh, we were hoping mm -hmm. that by delaying, normally he would be the person who kicks off our annual, our Hot Lunch in the fall. But we thought if we delayed it to January, we might potentially have the chance to do hot lunch in person. Um, I don't have to tell you what happened uh, to those hopes and dreams. And, and as with many of us, uh, we're, we're deferring still the return to some somewhat uh, normal, and I'm sure this will be a topic. Uh, but good news is that um, very recently, uh, President Ono was named one of the uh, most 50 powerful people by Vancouver Magazine. So most powerful and influential people along with Ryan Reynolds. And um, so that's pretty good company uh, as well as Stanley Park Coyotes, which um, I'm not as sure that uh, uh, what that means. But uh, again, we're very proud of our, uh, our President Ono for, for really being uh, the face of UBC outside UBC. Um, and uh, Vancouver Magazine wrote that uh, where the list was published, it said that to be powerful today is to be generous, to wield one's impact with grace, and to affect change on scales large and small. So everyone on that list, including the Coyotes, uh, had to fit that definition, but uh, uh, we're happy that uh, President Ono, in representing UBC, has, uh, has fit that uh, definition for for powerful and influential. So without any any further comments, um, I'm going to pass it over to President Ono. Um, there will be a chance for you to um, uh, post uh, questions uh, on Slido. Uh, there are I know many of you have already sent in questions as part of registration. So my thanks. I will pass some of those on to to uh, President Ono as, as much as possible with the time uh, you know, time permitting. But uh, Please also uh, use this Slido. You can uh, use the QR code to uh, to get the with your phone if you have your phone handy, um, or use the website URL. So feel free to also be posting and uh, voting each other's questions uh, up and down on Slido um, uh, as uh, President Ono speaks. So, without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, President Ono. Well, thank you very much. I was going to ask you if you could please uh, take down that slide so I can see as many faces as possible. It's really wonderful to see all of you uh, today. Thank you for joining me uh, for this hot lunch. Believe it or not, this is my sixth year at UBC. 
and I do look forward to, to having this interaction. I'm going to try to leave a lot of time so that I can respond to the many questions that have already been received, and I'm anticipating additional questions as well. So I'm going to keep at a relatively high level some of the things and updates that I think might be of, of general interest. Uh, but then uh, be happy to, to answer those questions and any additional questions that you might have. The first thing I want to say is, yes, happy Lunar uh, New Year. And we'll be having, some of you will be involved in that uh, later today. And uh, happy New Year just in general. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, 2022 will be the beginning, hopefully, of the end of this pandemic. As many of you know, there's a uh, uh, a view among public health uh, experts, including our very own, that uh, we are moving towards uh, an endemic phase of the uh, of COVID-19. And let's hope that uh, any future variants, and there are variants that are arising all the time, will be um, less uh, uh, pathogenic and uh, hopefully less transmissible than Omicron so that we can uh, manage uh, uh, this pandemic with a growing arsenal of tools, uh, some of uh, which, as you know, uh, have been uh, developed either recently or over the past several decades at UBC. Uh, I'm gonna just pause there. And uh, if you haven't been following, one of our faculty members who have been here for over four decades is really at the heart of a key uh, intervention in COVID-19, and that is the mRNA vaccines. And some of you may actually even work uh, with or near uh, Professor Peter Cullis, um, who, as you know, has been at UBC for a long time and was very interested in lipid bilayers and uh, uh, was actually contacted by uh, colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and, and elsewhere uh, regarding his ability to, to make uh, nanoparticles uh, to encapsulate all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, the idea then was to encapsulate uh, the part of the genome, the messenger RNA, that is sort of a copy of your gene and to deliver that as a way of uh, expressing proteins. And in this case, in, in serving as a vaccine. And uh, some of you may know that uh, just, I think two days ago or less than two days ago, Peter Cullis shared an international award worth $3 million with one of those individuals that contacted him about creating a new generation of vaccines, Drew Weissman from the University of Pennsylvania. And so uh, Peter Cullis from UVC and Drew Weissman of Penn and one other investigator from Germany uh, were awarded with the inaugural VIN Future uh, Award, which recognizes a transformative uh, innovation uh, that is having an impact on millions of people, and in this case, billions of people. So I hope you're proud that this institution that we all support and lift up has had an impact on billions of people. So if, you, if you've taken Pfizer, if you've taken Moderna, then you have personally been impacted by research coming out of UBC. Um, he has won other international awards, and I think he's probably a a strong candidate for the very top award that exists for research in physiology and medicine. And we'll just keep our fingers crossed and hope that he gets that recognition, which I think is richly deserved. But beyond uh, UBC's role in, in mRNA vaccines, you also know that uh, technology from UBC um, out, out of, uh, of, of, of our own laboratories, uh, resulted in an in, in antibody approach uh, and the founding of another spinoff. So Qtis was one for nanoparticles and Abcellera was another spinoff company that, as you know, there are a couple of major uh, programs that are inter intervening with COVID-19 by actually neutralizing the virus using a panel of antibodies that are engineered in the laboratory. And that's also a major tool uh, in the toolkit. And, and that was uh, uh, through Abcellera, as you know. And the other, one of the other major approaches, as you know, are these small molecule inhibitors of viral replication or the binding of the virus that causes COVID-19 to its receptor 
Some of you may know that the receptor for the virus for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, was discovered by a UBC scientist, Josef Penninger, prior to his arrival here. Uh, but uh, so, so that fundamental piece of knowledge of how the virus infects and causes COVID-19 um, is something where a UBC scientist is really a, a global leader. And uh, he had led an international effort prior to coming here to identify small molecules on the idea that this family of viruses might be inhibited in terms of the diseases that they cause. And so there was a head start in, in, in knowing the kinds of small molecules that might have an effect uh, as an intervention in blocking the spread of the, of the, of the virus. And, um, and that's uh, Josef Penninger again, um, where there's an approach to actually look at these small molecules and see if they have any clinical uh, impact on disease. And most recently, um, you probably know that variants are uh, understanding variants that arise spontaneously is really important in intervening with disease. And you know that the Omicron virus, uh, this is not, believe me, this is not a biomedical lecture. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited about it because that's what I do for a living. But this is something we all talk about. So I hope you'll bear with me. The, the Omicron variant uh, results from a number of mutations, an unusual number of mutations, many of which that affect the spike protein. If you look at the picture of the virus on the national or on CTV, You've all seen the spikes that are protruding from the outside capsid of the virus. Um, and so uh, you should be proud that it's a UBC investigator that uh, for the first time solved the three-dimensional structure of the spike protein. That's really important as uh, we and other investigators around the world try to develop um, ways to understand uh, to what extent you need to create vaccines just for Omicron or for new variants and to what extent you can develop strategies to immunize people or vaccinate people uh, with uh, vaccines that provide broad protection against a number of different variants. So in this case, Delta and Omicron. So you can see that uh, UBC is playing an outsized role in, in how we fight COVID-19. It's been recognized. I'm one of the co-chairs of a, of a panel that was uh, charged by the former prime minister of New Zealand uh, who had met with the WHO, the World Health Organization, and we are drafting a, a white paper and a set of recommendations on how universities collectively can uh, create an approach which makes us more resilient to future pandemics. So let me start with that. Um, COVID-19 pandemics, every time you turn on the news, it dominates the news. We yearn for the day where it's not the top news item, uh, but uh, it is part of our life. And so I think it's appropriate for us uh, to start with UBC and the role that we're playing in fighting the pandemic and also in uh, protecting not only us at UBC and in Canada, but people from around the world so that hopefully we won't have to experience uh, an impact of something that takes a couple of years to solve like uh, we're dealing with right now. So let me tell you a little bit about, that's what I want to say about COVID-19. Um, I also want to say that uh, certainly close to home, this has impacted us all and beyond fighting it and protecting us, uh, that um, it's made uh, for difficult decisions for society and for institutions like UBC. And I wanted to actually spend a little bit of time so that you can all understand how we go about making these decisions. And if you ask a, a dean or a provost or a president anywhere around the world, whether it's easy to actually make these decisions about whether you should be face-to-face -face or whether you should be remote or whether it should be hybrid and when's the right time to come back to in-person instruction, they'll all tell you it's the hardest thing they've ever had to do. And it's very hard because, um, you know, COVID-19 and the virus that causes it is constantly throwing curveballs. Whether you're the head of a province or a nation, or an institution, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen with this virus. And in the early days, uh, in 2020, we knew nothing about the virus. We know much more about the virus now. And I would say that if there's one positive thing about it, it's pretty much now common knowledge. Uh, what's happening with cases, what's happening with hospitalizations, what's happening with ICUs. 
Um, and whether or not masks are, are helpful or not. And, and you all have seen in front of your eyes how the thinking about that has changed, uh, even with the same individual over a period of time. That's because we're learning. We're all learning. So I will be announcing later today the decision uh, that we will have made uh, regarding what happens after February 7th. But let me just start off by telling you how we actually go about making these decisions. This is not a decision that I make. It's not a decision that the executive makes. It's a widely consultative process. And it's not just something that uh, um, is based upon our conversations and our sort of getting a sense or a pulse on what people want. That's one aspect of it. But you can imagine as a, a public university funded by both the federal government and the provincial government with both governments and businesses in our communities, uh, many, many stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, and uh, parents and grandparents all having an interest in what we do. This is a multifactorial problem like none of them. We have to pay attention to what the provincial government wants. Uh, and the provincial government, as you know, has not been uh, shy about telling myself and others what they'd like to see happen in terms of face-to-face -face instruction and when that should occur. Uh, some of you know that we received letters from the public health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. We received letters from the Minister of Advanced Education strongly recommending about what the mode of instruction should be and when. And uh, as you can see from our decisions, uh, we have uh, not always uh, followed that recommendation um, uh, in a straightforward way. Um, you may or may not know that of the 25 universities in the province of British Columbia, we are the only one that is not face-to-face -face in instruction today. The, others one, the other ones are already face-to-face. -face. So that should illustrate to you how we don't always, um, are, are, we're not always in step with what a key stakeholder would like us to do. And that's because we are an autonomous institution. We do have the right to go on our own path and determine what's best for the members of our community, the staff, the faculty, and the students and their parents. And we have articulated that very clearly to the government. It's not that we disrespect the advice or the recommendation, but we, through the University Act, have the autonomy to make those decisions because every institution is different, every circumstance is different, and the a shared governance aspect of making the decision to me is very, very important. For me to, without taking into account the wishes of the community, to blindly follow a recommendation from a government is not what you uh, found me or you've asked me to do. My job is to serve you. And, to, and, that, required, and that shapes the approach by which we come to these decisions. So we get inputs from the governments. We get uh, inputs uh, from across both campuses. And that's complicated because the public health situation in the lower mainland is not always the same as the public health situation in the interior. So we have to weigh what's happening with COVID both in the interior and also in the lower mainland. We also have to assess um, the impacts of COVID on students and faculty and staff getting here. And uh, as you know, uh, when you're talking about uh, coming out with a decision that uh, will inform, you know, tens of thousands of international st students actually traveling, when in some cases they can't travel, when in some cases they want to travel, but, uh, but there are uh, logistical issues with testing or with study permits, it becomes even more complicated. So we weigh all those sorts of things. We study the ability of people to get uh, to campus. We study, and that's relevant today. And we study um, um, not only the public health information provided to us from the PHO, but we have direct conversations with the regional health authorities, both Vancouver Coastal and in, in the interior. So we, we have regular touch, touch points with them. We have our own internal set of experts. We have a school of population of public health. We're fortunate that Dave uh, Patrick is a, a world authority in pandemics. Uh, 
I, I have regular conversations with him and other members of SPPH. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, we are the home of many members of the Independent COVID Modeling Group. And you've probably seen uh, Sally Otto, Dan, Dan Coombs and others often on television because their modeling of what's happening with COVID-19 informs what the BCCDC thinks and does and recommends. And they also independently advise me. So when we come to a decision point like the one we're gonna to make today about what happens after February 7th, we integrate all of that information. Yesterday night, we looked at recently crunched data on what was happening with cases. Now that's not very reliable because we don't have a lot of testing, right? But uh, we can at, at least look at the trends of what's happening with cases here in Vancouver Coastal and also relevant to UBCO. We have um, looked at hospitaliz hospitalizations. We have looked at deaths. We have looked at ICU admissions. We looked at it by age band. So we pour over this data and that evidence uh, informs what we think is the best course of action for the well-being and safety of the faculty, staff, and students of this institution. That's how complicated it is. Uh, often we speak with the public health officers twice a week uh, to, uh, to get a handle on that. Now, the other thing we do obviously is think about, okay, if we do come back to face-to-face -face, uh, instruction and uh, we move away from remote work to hybrid or to some extent in some offices back to in-person work, which is relevant to all of you, we have to think about how are we there? How are we prepared to protect you? So I'm happy to say, as you will hear later today, that we've procured 300,000 medical masks for distribution. We should have enough for everyone uh, that's working on both campuses, whether you're a faculty member, staff member, or student. And you can see if you actually do an analysis across the landscape of higher education, virtually no other institution will be making that uh, available to the entire community. In addition to making medical masks available on both campuses, we have also purchased uh, testing kits. So we, we plan to make those available to faculty, staff, and students because we know that testing is important for confidence uh, in uh, coming back to in-person either teaching or work. The last thing, as you know, which has been very, very complicated, but as you know from our communications is we were one of the few universities to actually stand up the declaration slash mandatory testing policy in this province. It's something that exists in other provinces. I have to admit that it has been quite laborious. It didn't move as quickly as we hoped, but we have stood it up and you have received emails from us. I'm happy to say that almost 99% of faculty, staff and students have actually declared and have declared proof of vaccination. And we have now vetted that. So that hopefully will give you all a, a, a level of confidence in what's happening here at UBC. And the actual public health data uh, clearly indicate that all of those steps have been helpful. Um, if you actually look at Vancouver Coastal, if you, and of which UBC is a major contributor to public health situations, or if you actually look at the testing that's going on where it's mandatory on campus, for example, residence halls and varsity athletes, there is very little, there was until December, virtually no uh, internal transmission. There were a couple of cases that you've heard of. There was a case uh, in, in the Sauter School of Business and, and they actually then went off offsite and socialized and there was some spread there. Um, and there, there, was, uh, there has been some spread within first year residences, for example, in Banyan. Uh, but up until December, all that was contact traced, and we can say to you with confidence that we're very little transmission. Everything changed, as you know, with Omicron. Uh, uh, as you can probably uh, tell from uh, Bonnie Henry's own comments, uh, she expects everyone will be eventually COVID uh, positive. Many of you have probably already contracted COVID-19. Fortunately, um, there, uh, th there have not been very severe uh, consequences with a few exceptions to, for, for those infections. I can tell you that in speaking with uh, presidents around the world, 
that although there has been an uptick in COVID cases uh, on both campuses, that in comparison to similar sized universities elsewhere, it's a fraction of what's occurring elsewhere. So, so all of this that we've done and our commitments to providing masks and testing, uh, I think uh, when we do come back to face, to face uh, teaching and, 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 and we move away from hybrid to face-to-face -to -face work where uh, it's warranted and it makes sense and decided at the local level, I think we're pretty well positioned uh, relative to our peers to do so safely. That has always been uh, the primary consideration uh, for us, for me, uh, in making these decisions. It's for that reason that it takes a lot of time because the parameters are changing. Although we wish we could have a crystal ball and have figured out in mid-December what was gonna happen here uh, in late January, you just can't tell. You, you, you just have to look at what's happening um, in terms of the public health data as you move through from week to week. And, and, and that is, I think, the most robust way to make decision. I've spoken a lot, and I said I was going to leave uh, time for questions, because I'm going to wrap that up, and I'm going to answer any questions that we have. But I want to talk about something other than COVID-19, if that's OK. The uh, first thanks, thing... Pre <laughs> thanks <laughs> President Ono. Yeah, so let me um, stop. Can I just make one more comment? Yeah. There's so much to be proud of and happy about. Uh, you probably have heard about all of our Order of, our Order of Canada um, honorees, uh, whether uh, they're um, staff or faculty or whether they're alumni. Uh, we had a banner year in terms of the number of people inducted into the Order of Canada. Um, and um, you probably know that we uh, had quite a few Canada Research Chairs that uh, were named in the most recent competition that was uh, results in about a 19 or 19 or $20 million influx of <coughs> support for our research and for, for our scholarship at the university. Uh, and the last thing I wanna say really quickly, two more things, is Campus Vision 2050. You're gonna hear from me over and over again over the next several weeks, uh, especially with the pandemic, but also because we are trying to think about um, our plans over the next uh, you know, 20, 20 to 30 years. <coughs> we need your feedback in this uh, campus vision. We've done it at the Okanagan. We really have to think about what our campus is gonna look like as a place to work, as a place to play, as a place to live. Increasingly, there are now 25,000 people who live on campus. We need your feedback. So please take some time and be part of the conversation about shaping our vision of what kind of campus we're gonna build moving from now until 2050. So that's one thing I wanna say. The last thing I wanna say is that you know that uh, we spent a, quite a bit of time over the past year and a half talking about diversity and inclusion. Um, and uh, we've tried to lead not only at an institutional level, but uh, on a national and global level. We will be releasing in the very new, near future. As you know, I, I, I created a, a task force, an anti-racism task force, because of um, you know, the findings from Mary Ellen Trapel Lafon, for example, uh, who, uh, who published a seminal uh, analysis of uh, indigenous uh, racism in our healthcare system and the role that we, responsibilities that we have as an educational institution populating these health professions in addressing that uh, anti-Indigenous racism. Uh, so whether we're talking about anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian uh, uh, racism, or anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, all of that is a matter of concern because we want UBC to be an inclusive place. And so uh, regardless of your national origin, or, or what you, uh, the color of your skin, that everyone should feel uh, embraced and part of this uh, community. It's easier said than done. Um, but to do so, uh, we tried to do it in a, in a, in a way where uh, it wasn't top down. And, and so that's why it's, it was organized as, as a task force. Um, I can tell you it's, it's, it's extraordinary, the set of recommendations that have been made by this group. Some of you have probably been involved in it, hundreds of people, were involved and that will be released in the near future um, so that there are a set of recommendations of what we can do to make UBC and there's work to do. That's the first thing I wanna say. I know Shirley Nakata is here, there's work to do. And, and this is not a task force report to sit on a shelf. It says some things that are uncomfortable. 
it sets some things that we have to do as an institution to make this a better place, and we will do it. It will be the roadmap to making UBC a more diverse and inclusive place for all, all of us. Um, and I'll tell you some of the stories that we heard, because the beginning of it was me listening to hundreds of people, if not a thousand people. And some of the stories were painful and we have to do better and, and we will. So that's coming out pretty soon. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, I wanna thank everybody who has been involved. I look forward to sharing that uh, with the community. Uh, I know that it impacts several of you and we are committed and that's not just me, but the board of governors and the full executive are, are committed to, to taking those learnings and uh, taking the steps and making the investments to make this really home for everyone. I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, President Ono. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to continue that you, the, your desire to not uh, talk only about the pandemic with, with one question, then we're, we're going to sure. probably move you back towards uh, a, a lot of the questions which do deal with the pandemic. But, but let's, let's start with uh, someone put, wants to know what your favorite Japanese food is. So uh, and that, that may be a good, uh, good switch from the pandemic for a little bit. Favorite okay. for Japanese foods. Well, my favorite Japanese food from since, since I was a child is something called sukiyaki. Yaki means uh, to cook, suki means sweet. Sukiyaki is uh, sort of like a hot pot, which is Japanese, uh, which has, a, it has sugar in it, so it's kind of sweet. Uh, thinly shaved beef, the finer the beef, the better, together with uh, vegetables and tofu. And so I highly recommend sukiyaki, and you just usually eat it with a bowl of rice. Perfect for hot lunch uh, to uh, get everybody inspired to, to go find a bowl of sukiyaki. Um, one of the questions that I think a lot of people are interested in, do you, do you feel hybrid working arrangements for staff are here to stay? Uh, that I do. Kind of work from home? I do. I mean, one of the things that's almost certain from this pandemic is that many of us uh, work uh, maybe in some cases even more efficiently at home than uh, we do. At, at work, you can see I'm home right now, um, and and we're doing this hot lunch. Now I don't want to uh, move to a situation where it's always hot lunch is always like this. Um, I want to be with you, but um, you know this is the safest thing to do right now. Um, but in terms of uh, every all of us, you know there are uh, moments um, uh, where we can do our job very well, perfectly well uh, at home, and in some cases people commute from Surrey or from Richmond, um, and this this takes out of the, the you know day the requirement to, to travel to get to work so I think we as an institution we as a sector just like every other sector is going to have to continue to think about to what extent uh, should we continue uh, uh, the hybrid nature or remote work and and, and how are we going to ensure that it's, it's equitable because some people have to be here you know and uh, and so all that's being worked on with the remote work policy but I think it's here for here to stay and there's some major benefits you know there's uh, the impact on the climate you know if we're, if we're not actually uh, driving back and forth or on buses going back and forth then we have a positive impact on GHG uh, emissions um, and uh, in terms of wellness you know uh, but I got to tell you that a lot of people that we serve it actually have said the last thing they want to do is to be compelled to be remote work all the time some of them can't wait to get away and the change of scenery for their mental uh, wellness, actually coming to work for some is something that they look forward to. So that's why hybrid is really, I think, what we have to explore. Thank you, President. Um, kind of related is, is the student experience. Um, do you see a kind of a hybrid remote learning also continuing even after the pandemic? So we've just approved uh, in more block funding to support uh, hybrid uh, teaching. Um, I can tell you in all of our consultations and in, in speaking with the AMS, the SUO, and the GSS, that people are in different places. Some people uh, can't wait to get back to face-to-face -face instruction. Others are genuinely worried, sometimes for very good reasons, because they have an Im immunocompromised parent or grandparent. And so I think that we have to be ready uh, to, uh, to support that um, and to provide the resources uh, to support um, that kind of hybrid teaching. Um, I think that um, there are also uh, circumstances uh, where, um, you know, we have to, um, you know, we've made significant investments in, in, in infrastructure technology, 
to facilitate that. Uh, but uh, we need to do more of that. Uh, not all of the of the classrooms are set up for le lecture capture, and we, we need to continue to make investments so that we can make it possible and easy for for instructors to capture lectures. And we we there's some of it's culture change. You know, we also have to look at the workload for staff and faculty that's associated with that. Are we just adding additional responsibilities onto faculty and staff, or are we recognizing that this is creating more work? Um, and, and how are we in the faculties, how are the heads and directors and the deans supporting faculty and staff with the added responsibility of bimodal instruction that comes with hybrid? Thank you. Um, switching though, you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, Professor Collis, uh, uh, you know, winning a prize. Um, and one of the questions uh, has to do with, in some sense, with, with money. UBC uh, Tech fighting uh, COVID. Uh, Yet Pfizer and Moderna are charging governments $41 billion above cost as a public university. How do we ensure our discoveries remain public goods? I think that's really a, a matter for a debate. Uh, as you know, um, the licensing and intellectual property decisions for some of that, because it's like four decades old, some of it's off, off that there actually, there's no funds flow actually to the institution. Some universities would say that's stupid. Um, you know, because in the resources coming into the institution will help offset uh, the operations of the of the university. So, but there's got to be an honest conversation. I mean, there there cur there certainly are disparities in the availability of medicines and vaccines. Um, the uh, privileged and and wealthy nations have better access and are hoarding some of these things. So that's the kind of conversation that a university can lead. And uh, the outcomes of those conversations should guide what we do as a university moving forward. So I think it's a very good question. Uh, we have a lot of soul searching to do, not just UBC, but every, the whole sector. Uh, and just the, just the enterprise of, of, of bioinnovation and biomanufacturing. We have a lot of thinking to do about that. And as you know, different jurisdictions approach that in a different way, but we should talk about it and we should, uh, we're, as part of that white paper that we're working on for the WHO, that's one of the things that is, that is under uh, discussion. Great. Um, I, I, some people have been asking about what the arrangements are going to be post February 7th, but I believe you you said that you'll be making an announcement uh, later today. So um, so you're not going to preempt that announcement. OK, so I, I won't ask that direct question uh, yeah. uh, unless you I, I, want to actually answer and, and give a heads up as to the messaging that you'll be giving later today. Let okay. me explain why. It's because of what I said. It's the shared governance, right? So what's going on as we speak are that we're touching base with this, the agenda committee of the Senate. We're getting feedback from the governors. We're getting feedback. We've already met with all the deans on both campuses. And so uh, it's, it's a very complicated process. And so for me to say something now before it's been completed would disrespect somebody who has not yet provided feedback. That makes any sense. And, and we really appreciate, or I, I, I think many of us do, uh, that you've been very transparent about the decision-making process on, on how these kinds of decisions have been made. And so yet another example uh, of that. So our thanks. Um, I'm going to go to uh, something that I think a lot of us, uh, uh, you know, across university, faculty, staff, students, uh, uh, about the stress of the pandemic. And so uh, on the one hand, um, you know, some people have asked about, uh, well, how are we, you know, uh, helping the sort of frontline service workers and those at UBC who who are dealing with this, uh, you know, you know, in a way that perhaps is uh, uh, harder on them uh, than even those of us who are working remotely. Although working remotely also has its stresses, and and some others are also asking, how are you handling your own stress as uh, as an individual, um, you know, as well as UBC president? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the second question about how I'm handling it. Uh, I really appreciate that question, but I, I'm a very pri privileged person. Um, and, and so I, I, I realized that um, the impact of the pandemic on me is very different than on, on, on others. So it's really, I appreciate the question, but it's just really not worth talking about too much. I mean, I, I do other things like I play my cello and things like that, and I try to divert my concerns away from that. But the, the more important question is the first one about the frontline um, um, in members of staff and some student workers and faculty that are constantly at the front line. And to answer that question, uh, the first there's the focus on PPE, right? So 
Um, as you've probably been following in the news, there's been quite an outcry in some of our sister institutions. First of all, with the decision to go face-to-face -face this week, um, even in this province, there are, are strikes and there are walkouts going on uh, because uh, people are, are not confident that, uh, that uh, the peak is over, right, uh, for the Omicron uh, uh, virus. And, and so uh, one of the ways uh, we've been trying to look after the, the well-being and safety of our community is to be uh, uh, cautious, to, to be conservative in that decision. We are the only university out of 25 that hasn't gone straight back to face-to-face -to -face instruction and teaching um, this, this week. We're gonna be two weeks later than everybody else. And that's in recognition of uh, doing everything we can to keep people safe, number one. Um, number two, um, as I just said earlier today, and will be in my announcement, other institutions have said, it's your responsibility uh, in terms of your masks. Um, and uh, number one, we will say, uh, which is going above and beyond the pro public health guidance, we will say that we strongly encourage medical masks. Um, that's not in the provincial guidelines. We strongly believe uh, in reviewing our own expertise, in reviewing expertise from the CDC and elsewhere, that medical masks are better than cloth masks. Now, of course, medical masks have to be fitted and worn properly. Otherwise, you're just going to have the virus coming around in the little uh, space between the mask and your face. Right. So we do want to educate people on how to put on a mask properly. Uh, that'll be part of, um, of our responsibilities to educate our entire community on how to properly put on a medical mask. But the other part is it's expensive to buy these um, and many sister organizations are not buying them. But we think that um, some, some members of our community are fortunate that they have access to N95 or N94 masks or medical masks. Um, you know, some, some people have lots of those, some people have none of them can't get access to them. So we wanted to make sure we had a supply so that those who don't have access to medical masks can have one. And so that's the other way we're trying to look after the well-being of people on the front line. Thanks. Um, I, I related, there was a question that actually is at the top of our slide on, it's like, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, perhaps keeping a kind of hybrid model of remote work and uh, one person at, or 16 people have, uh, have asked and upvoted once in-person classes have resumed with all will all staff who do not directly work with student instruction um, also be required to return to campus so this is in some sense what kinds of staff do you see as as being the ones who are most uh, prioritized for coming back yeah. well first of all i'd love to have feedback on that and people you know I get tons of direct messages and emails on a normal situation during the pandemic has gone five, up fivefold, as you can imagine. And, and that feedback that I received is really, really helpful because, you know, as a leader, if all I hear is the, the executive or the deans, um, then I, I, that doesn't give me a, a very clear and accurate picture of what it feels like to be a member of staff in a particular uh, department in forestry, right? So I, the only way I can get it a clear picture of what you everyone is feeling is if I get input. And that's why I encourage uh, people to contact me, and people do. Um, now I should say that, as you know, it would be inappropriate for there to be a one-size-fits-all solution. This is a mammoth university with many, many different kinds of circumstances, right? Um, there are different requirements based upon accreditation of programs that, uh, whether you're a staff member or a faculty member, we all support that, right? And so that's part of our core mission. That will impact on what's happening if you're a staff member in that kind of a program as opposed to another. So there is heterogeneity in the expectations of what we provide and deliver programmatically that will impact on what we do. Um, also, there are agreements between the institution and different bargaining units, right? Um, and so we have to honor those. And I cannot, as a president of the university, preempt any of those conversations. And in many cases, we're in the midst of those uh, negotiations. So it would be inappropriate for me to say right now, but the more feedback and input I get uh, will inform me as we sit at the bargaining table to discuss things like this, which will almost certainly be part of those conversations. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, I'm going to switch uh, to a 
sort of as you did away from the pandemic for a bit for a couple of questions uh since uh, one of the ones that's being asked by quite a few people is is the potential expansion of the broadway subway line or a side train line out to ubc looking more encouraging so a, a bit of an update on the the sky train yeah, absolutely as you all know because you've been watching me it's been a, a major priority for me and for our executive uh during my six years as president <clears throat> and we had a breakthrough last year and so People are getting tired of me talking about it. And uh, we have press conferences. I write about it. I go to Ottawa. I go to Victoria. I talk to all the mayors and the mayor's council. And the reason why you got to do that is that it's not a decision made by one government or one person. All of those entities um, have to be aligned for this to move forward because it's so expensive. And also because there are many demands on TransLink. Um, broad, broad, the Broadway line to UBC is important. Everybody agrees with that. But also, uh, uh, transportation uh, to uh, North Vancouver, transportation uh, to uh, the Fraser Valley, to Langley, all those are important as well. And, and all of those jurisdictions are actually saying, you know, for, with this finite amount of money, our transportation need has to be addressed, okay? Uh, the fact of the matter is that UBC has been advocating for this uh, TransLink or SkyTrain to UBC for a long time. Previous premiers have been involved uh, both both kinds of government have been involved. They have different ideas on whether it should be sky train or it should be uh, light rail. And so there's been a lot of conversation about it. Um, and it, it's not easy to get everybody aligned, all the mayors, the federal government, and the provincial government. Last year was a breakthrough uh, because uh, we got two things, um, and we were part of that, was a, a line item in the federal budget so that every year there will be money to support transportation projects across Canada. So that was important because there needs to be a source of money to fund SkyTrain to UBC. Number two, um, we were able to tap into some, that, some of that money for the business planning uh, for, 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 the, for um, this extension. And, and we are hearing very positive things now from provincial government and from the mayor's council. So I've been, I'm more optimistic than I have ever been that this is gonna become a reality. Drive around Vancouver, you can already see Broadway. You can see many lanes that are blocked off. You can see gigantic holes in the ground. The boring machines are actually starting to, to bore holes around Emily Carr and Great Northern Way and CDN. You can see it and even coming up Broadway, it's really happening. And so with the money there and with enthusiasm growing, uh, our effort is to tell them keep that boring machine in the ground until you come out near UBC and go into an elevated uh, SkyTrain. And uh, in a, obviously it involves cooperation and it's been very positive with First Nations, with Musqueam. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so, that, so I, I think it's, it's, it's in a pretty good, pretty good situation. I'm pretty optimistic it's gonna happen. Great, well, that's great news. And uh, we're looking forward to, to that first ride on, on, on a SkyTrain. Um, the next question up uh, is what is, you mentioned uh, RE task force, the anti-racism and inclusive excellence task force. Uh, what is your view of the current state of, of EDI at the university or, or of, uh, you know, what, what's, what's the report uh, in some sense uh, dealing with and, and, yeah. um, and highlighting? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, let's thank you, Henry, because uh, one big accomplishment accomplishment during this period of time was the anti-Asian uh, racism uh, summit that was uh, that was hosted uh, by UBC and you were a key leader uh, along with others, Shirley Nakata as well. And, and that has been so well received. Um, it's impacting uh, what the federal government is gonna do. Um, as, you, as you know, unfortunately, there was quite a bit of anti-Asian racism during the early stages of the pandemic. It continues today. Um, people were hurt. Um, with violent acts, um, and so it was sorely needed. Uh, and, and also, as you know, uh, and some of the other members of this audience know, that uh, Asian faculty and staff and students uh, were afraid to even leave their residence hall or their apartment because of certain things that they were subjected to. We had a student attack outside of H Mart uh, here on campus. So uh, thank you for your leadership. That, to answer your question, there is need, you know, whether you're Jewish or, or uh, whether you're uh, Muslim or Asian or Black, uh, the stories that I heard in those listening sessions are painful. 
And so where are we? We have work to do. Um, but the good news is that we have hundreds of people that have come together to say, we love this place. We wanna, we wanna make this a better place where everybody feels comfortable. Now, there's been a big change. Um, a longstanding uh, head of EIO, Sarah Jane Finley, has moved on to take, accept another job at ICBC. Uh, thank her for her work and congratulate her on that new assignment. Gives us uh, uh, an opportunity to identify another, another leader and we will do so. Uh, we're fortunate that Margaret Moss has stepped up uh, pro tem, but we are initiating a search uh, for a full-time leader uh, to, to move forward. Not only those initiatives, but also the work with the executive leads like Ainsley Carey, Nanya Mukherjee Reed. I'm sorry that she is leaving, but kudos to her for becoming a vice chancellor in her own right as a, as a, a, a woman uh, and a person of color. We need her to, to uh, advance and to lead. And so although it's our loss, it's uh, somebody else's gain. Um, so uh, I'm happy to announce that the, uh, the new deputy vice chancellor, I've, this has not been announced yet, but the, the, the new uh, provost, sorry, of the Okanagan campus uh, has, has agreed because it's such a priority uh, that, uh, that he will now uh, step in where Ananya was uh, to, uh, to, to serve as one of the two executive leads uh, for the anti-racism effort. So uh, that's where we are. There's, uh, where we are is we're having some changes. Uh, there, we have yet to identify a key leader, but uh, one of the uh, places that has opened with Ananya moving on in two days to be a vice chancellor is we already have someone ready uh, to step in there. Um, and uh, once the task force report is published, uh, we will, as you know, we've already focused on the first phase where we've already articulated a set of things that we're already moving on. We launched a, a Beyond Tomorrow Scholars Program, uh, one of the first in Canada. And we already have Black Canadian students matriculating at, at UBC. It's very needed because the MasterCard program uh, that brought in a number of, of Black Africans to, to, to UBC and other Canadian universities is winding down. So it's an opportune time for us to bring Black Canadians uh, to, to the UBC campus. But we're also, as you know, uh, we've earmarked funds to uh, recruit and retain Indigenous faculty, Black faculty uh, to the institution and also to address some of the things that we heard in our conversations as a possibility of safe spaces for individuals uh, to uh, get together and to celebrate um, their cultures and feel safe. And uh, that many institutions have those spaces, we do not. Uh, we do have a longhouse, First Nations longhouse. We're investing in that, making it better for our indigenous uh, students. But uh, we don't have spaces for appropriate spaces for prayer for uh, Muslim students, faculty and staff. And we want to do that. We want to provide that uh, because it's such an important part of, of their lives. And, and we have no space uh, for, for uh, Black students, and uh, we want to correct that. So these are just some of the examples of, of some of the recommendations within the task force. And we will, uh, we can't do it all at once. There's so much to do, but we're committed to doing it in a stepwise fashion. And, and I, I wanted to personally thank you for your leadership. Uh, you know, it's actually one of the things that is, is gratifying to be asked to to help, and and I know many uh, among the audience here uh, want to help, and so um, and your leadership in actually empowering many of us in the room to to do something uh, rather than feeling helpless is is, is really important. Uh, I know we're running up uh, to the end of the hour with you, and uh, uh, but maybe as a last question, uh, someone asked, what are your three priorities really in the next few years? And and you know, as a just as a almost a quick answer, uh, what do you see as your now top priorities as you've as you've uh, you know spent the last six years, as you said already, um, as as president. Well, you know, there are so many priorities, um, and you know, certainly, we're about two thirds of the way in implementing IRP, right? And uh, I bring that up not because it's the top priority, but because it's it would be crippling if we don't have backbone systems, right? So we're at a stage where we have implemented HR and finance, but as you know, there's more work to be done. You, you, it's just one thing to stand it up, but there's a lot of work that has to happen after you stand it up to get it optimized. And all of you know, as staff members, there's, it's still not functioning perfectly. So I've got to get that working properly because that's an investment for 30 or 40 years. So, and, and the, the university will crumble if we don't have that system, right? And the reason why 
as some of you may have heard in previous hot lunches, I said, we've got to bite the bullet. We have to do it. It's because if we didn't invest and create a new system, the university was in danger of falling apart, that we couldn't do anything. Um, and, and so one of my top priorities is making sure that HR finance are stood up, not only stood up, but also optimized. The, second, the last thing, obviously, is the third pillar of the system is the student system. The problem now, as you know, is the landscape. There's, with the exception of Workday, there's, there's really nothing else that a university of our size can turn to. So we really have to focus to make sure that the student system is stood up because that's core to what many of us do. And, and so that's one of the top priorities. You said two more, right? So IRP <laughs> is um, certainly two, I would say, um, academic excellence um, is, is the core of our reputation, right? Um, people like, uh, you know, Order of Canada recipients, Canada Research Chairs, CERCs, all those kinds of things. Um, that defines uh, our reputation. It's a magnet for faculty and staff and students from around the world. It's what makes us the number one most international university in North America is that people know UBC is excellence and we got to make sure it remains excellence so that people want to keep coming here and choose it as a destination. That's why we're undergoing this uh, largest ever hiring program in the history of UBC, the academic renewal uh, program or, or uh, PAEI, President's Academic Excellence Initiative, that we, we have identified lots of money so that we can attract and retain the faculty of the future. That's a big priority. And, 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 the, and, and third, uh, I would say this, this actual effort that we've been talking about, the uh, inclusivity, uh, um, an excellence, um, inclusive excellence initiative. Uh, now we have done all this work. We have probably the finest task force report anywhere, not only in Canada that I've seen anywhere. It's 330 pages. You've seen it, right, Henry? It's, it's remarkable. And every, so many things have been identified. And so the third priority is to make sure that we make substantive progress towards those recommendations. If you engage, almost a thousand people in, in saying, this is what we have to do, we better do it. That's it, that's the three. Thank you, President Ono. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, everybody, I invite everyone to, to do what you do on, uh, on Zoom to, 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 uh, to applaud our, our president for joining us and helping us. Um, just a couple announcements. Uh, I, I understand that uh, it's uh, it's not safe to gather for a line dance, but uh, uh, St. John's College uh, will be having a line dance. We're inviting dancers to come um, and perform, and people will watch them live stream uh, and and through the, so the windows of our dining hall. So uh, I know that President Ono has joined us before at our annual Lunar New Year uh, dinner. Uh, we've we won't be able to do that this year, but we're still going to bring the line. And, and there's a reason. Uh, in fact, lion dances off and dragon dances in China often were to ward off evil spirits. And we think of that as, oh, that's superstition. And what that meant also was things like plagues and viruses and, and disease. And, and it, one of the specific things uh, we hope that will happen is that uh, this will get rid of COVID if we bring uh, bring the lines through. And uh, and so they'll they'll get rid of them on UBC campus. So um, in any case, if you we we invite everyone to to join online, uh, we'll send out on the uh, mailing list if you'd like to just watch and listen to the line dance and get a little bit of cleansing yourself uh, uh, through through that uh, annual ritual. Um, uh, the other thing I want to do is uh, thank again our hot lunch committee. Um, for all the work they they put in, uh, especially virtual. So the uh, virtual uh, presentations uh, requires, uh, Jenny's been uh, handling the Slido, Stacy Barber has uh, handled a lot of the invites and things, and Shirley Nakata, uh, Eilish, Courtney, uh, Andrew Parr, again, our thanks. Um, there, you know, we'll see you at the next hot lunch. Uh, if, you know, hopefully before the end of this academic year, we might be able to, to find a way to be together, but if not, we'll, uh, in physically I mean, but if not, then we'll find a way to be together uh, virtually online again, as we did today. So again, our, our warmest um, thanks to you, President Ono for coming and and really sharing. And, and in, in my mind, I, I will say personally, uh, knowing that the decisions that are made that are hard decisions, you know, as you said, not everybody will be happy with the decisions made, but it's important for us all 
to know how you make decisions and and to uh, to feel that we can put our trust in you as our leader. So thank you so much for coming and sharing um, your own decision making processes and the consultative way uh, you listen uh, as you make decisions to all of us. So thank you again, and we'll see everyone next month at Hot Lunch. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.